we are going to end up this session with the, the new president of the society, Joe Valensky, who is going to tell us about anal cancer screening and prevention. So I'm delighted to be here and to give you a short presentation on the last remaining piece of genital real estate that really hasn't been covered. And that, of course, is the uh, anal canal. I'm going to focus on anal cancer screening and prevention. Of course, there are many parallels with what you've been hearing about with respect to the cervix. Before I begin, just a few disclosures. I'm an investigator uh, with some of the Merck studies and have received research grant and travel support from them sit on advisory boards, as well as for uh, Aura Biosciences and Pharmajet, and have received some research grant support from Hologic. So first, I'd like to very briefly remind us of the epidemiology of anal intraepithelial neoplasia and anal cancer, and then focus on prevention approaches, first talking about secondary prevention. By that, of course, I mean cytology, high-resolution anoscopy, HRA-guided biopsy and treatment and then uh, primary prevention, uh, talking about anal sex and um, getting people to avoid that is just as pointless as trying to uh, get them to not have uh, vaginal sex, and so we won't talk about that. We're really talking about vaccination here. So this is a uh, slide that you've seen many, many times, and I show it primarily to remind us that the anal canal is very similar histopathologically to the cervix, where we have a stratified squamous epithelium that can be very thin at the squamocolumnar junction, which exists at the confluence of the rectum and the anal canal. We see the same low-grade changes with coilocytosis as the pathognomonic feature. We see the same changes in terms of high-grade disease, and just as in the cervix, the expectation is that the low-grade lesions are not precancerous and that cancer primarily arises from the high-grade lesions. So the same morphologic continuum exists, including, of course, the uh, traversing the basement membrane to invade into the stroma, and that is uh, invasive cancer. So why is anal cancer worthy of your consideration and time? Well, firstly, it's really interesting from a biological standpoint. We have the same HPV types infecting two very different microenvironments and sometimes coming up with the same outcome and sometimes coming up with very different outcomes, not always for the most obvious reasons. So science is interesting, but from a clinical standpoint, it's also important to understand that the incidence of anal cancer is increasing in the general population, in both men and women, in every single um, registry that has reported these data, primarily from developed countries, since the 1970s, that is true in both men and women. Most of these countries actually show a higher incidence of anal cancer in the female population compared to males. But you can see, for instance, in this report from the SEER database, since the 1970s, that incidence is going up in both men and women and doesn't show, as of now, any signs of abating. Now, you'll also notice, if you look on the left side, that we're not talking about a big-time incidence here. These are still relatively rare cancers. But the, the nice thing, if you will, from a cancer control standpoint is that we have a pretty good idea of what the risk factors are and who the high-risk populations are. And thus, we can uh, focus most of our efforts on these populations that, in fact, have a much higher incidence of this cancer than the general population. So what are they? Well, firstly, let's put this in the context of cervical cancer. Before we were doing cervical cancer screening, the incidence in the United States of cervical cancer was about 40 to 50 per 100,000. It is still at that level or higher in many countries where there is no routine cervical cancer screening. Now, thanks to that program, it is down to about eight or so per 100,000. Now, one of those very classic high-risk populations that I've been referring to is men who have sex with men who presumably acquire HPV through receptive anal intercourse. And prior to the HIV epidemic, Janet Daling and colleagues estimated that the incidence of anal cancer in this group, so they were presumably HIV negative, was up to 35 per 100,000, which more or less puts it into the same ballpark as the incidence of cervical cancer in an unscreened population. Shouldn't be entirely surprising. So a priori, we have a population of people who are at higher risk of anal cancer uh, 
then a screened population of, is of cervical cancer for women. Now, um, we also know that immunosuppression plays a role in just about every HPV-related cancer, and anal cancer is no exception. And if you think about it, the worst possible scenario could be immunosuppression in the form of HIV because of many shared risk factors between HIV and HPV. Um, the early data after uh, the HIV epidemic began suggested that the incidence of anal cancer was about twice that of in HIV positive MSM compared to HIV negative. And the question then arose, what is going to happen with the advent of antiretroviral therapy? The hope was that the incidence of cancer would decline just as Kaposi's sarcoma has, as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has. But we actually published a paper in 1994 predicting the opposite for a variety of reasons. And unfortunately, that prediction has come to pass. And contrary to those other cancers, the incidence of anal cancer has only gone up since the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. This is an example of the very large NA Accord cohort published by Mike Silverberg not too long ago. And in it, he shows that the incidence of anal cancer in the post-ART era from 1996 to 2007 is actually 131 per 100,000. In uh, HIV-infected uh, men who have other risk factors, it's 46. And in HIV-infected women, it's 30. So all of these groups have very high incidence of anal cancer, particularly MSM. And one could argue that that incidence in MSM is higher than the highest incidences of cervical cancer anywhere in the world. Now, um, as a leading indicator, if we believe that the same paradigm is taking place here, that we're starting off with anal HPV infection, which at some point manifests itself in the form of a precancerous lesion, which ultimately progresses to cancer, looking at anal HPV infection data and AIN data can be informative as to what we might expect in the future. So these are some data that we collected post-ART. This was a um, random, uh, randomized digit dial and studying. So it is a population-based study. I think it's the only population-based study out there at this point. We called people on the telephone in San Francisco. We said, would you mind if we put something up your rear end? And, uh, and then come on in for another exam. And we got a good response. Um, and here, what I want to show you is that 43% of HIV positive MSM in this population-based study had a high-grade lesion in their anal canal. This is biopsy-proven disease. Even 25% of the HIV negative men had a high-grade lesion. So these numbers are enormous compared with what you might expect in the cervix in a healthy population of, of women. What about the women? Well, we've been also focusing on women because many studies have shown that the prevalence of anal HPV infection, in particularly in high-risk women, exceeds that of cervical HPV infection. Anal HPV infection turns out to be a very important part of both the normal ecology of the anogenital tract as well as in women with disease. When you're immunocompromised, then the risk of cancer is increased. And so we looked at the prevalence of AIN in HIV-positive women. These are data from the Women's Interagency HIV Study. And what we showed here was that the prevalence of cervical disease and anal disease in the HIV-positive women were essentially the same. And not surprisingly, they were same in HIV-negative women too, but lower in the HIV-negative women compared to the positive women. So the High prevalence of anal HPV infection does uh, translate into a high prevalence of disease. Is this true only in uh, immunocompromised women? The answer is no. Um, again, anal cancer is a rare disease in the general population of women, but there are risk groups of women, just like there are of men. And one of those groups of risk are women who've had other HPV-related neoplastic lesions, uh, women with a history of cervical cancer particularly women with a history of vulvar cancer. The closer you get to the anus, the higher the risk of anal disease. This was a study of otherwise healthy women in Tennessee, 205 women showing up at a dysplasia clinic uh, with a history of lesions in one of these locations. And then they did a routine test to see how many of them had anal disease. And overall, 12% did. 8% of them had high-grade disease. So this is not rare. <clears throat> 
So what are we going to do about all this? Again, I think we're in the good position of being able to focus our resources on smaller groups of people at higher risk. And given the biological similarity, the association with HPV, the histologic similarity between the cervix transformation zone and, and the anal transformation zone, we and others have proposed that these at-risk people be assessed with the very same techniques that we're struggling to perfect in the cervix. That would include uh, anal cytology, where we blindly put up an anal swab, followed by a, a high-resolution anoscopy, which actually uses a colposcope, but colpos means vagina in Greek, so we call it high-resolution anoscopy, or HRA, looking for many of the same signs and symptoms. Now, one point I want to make is that when we're doing this, we're trying to prevent anal cancer. We also need to make sure that our patients don't have prevalent anal cancer. And even if you don't have the training in the form of cytology or HRA, we all have the diagnostic test at our capability to look for anal cancer, and that's this, okay, our fingers. We should be doing a digital, I'm not calling it anymore a digital rectal exam. The literature is replete with that word DRE. We are calling it a DARE, digital ano rectal exams, because we're feeling for anal cancer. Sorry that doesn't show up so well in this light, but this guy's got a very big finger, okay? <laughs> and uh, he's uh, touting the victory of the San Francisco Giants in the recent World Series. Anyhow, uh, the point is you should be feeling for anal lumps and bumps uh, in your patients. But if you have that capability, it is great if you can, using a very similar approach to what we've done in the cervix, difference being that if a patient even has ascus, then they get referred for anoscopy, treated if they have a high-grade lesion, followed if they have a low-grade lesion, cytology repeated with these intervals if that cytology is negative, depending on the HIV status. So again, who do we think ought to be screened at this point? This is a list. It includes all HIV positive men regardless of sexual orientation, so not just MSM, but somebody who may have acquired HIV through heterosexual intercourse or injection drug use. And you'll notice that I've also said over the age of 30. We're doing the same thing or trying to do the same thing that we've been doing in the cervical world, which is pull back from the youngest people. I see no need to mangle people in their early 20s and their late teens with these procedures when their risk of cancer is really low. So I would love to see this start later, typically over the age of 30 if you're HIV positive, 40 if you're HIV negative. And then, as we've discussed, women with high-grade cervical or vulvar lesions or cancer, HIV positive women for all the same reasons as the HIV negative women, anybody who's got a lesion on the outside of the anus, be it high-grade disease or condyloma is probably at risk for intra-anal disease. And then other forms of immune suppression, we haven't talked much about that, but there is a well-known increase in incidence of anal cancer, for instance, in uh, kidney transplant patients. They should be considered for screening as well. Now, what are we going to do about it? We could talk a lot of, about various treatment options, but the one that we are most excited about is called infrared coagulation, primarily because it is a technique that non-surgeons, such as myself, can learn to do with very good safety in patients. I'm an infectious disease trained doc. We think that this can be done by non-surgeons. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And basically, it involves putting this uh, probe in through an anoscope and touching the lesion, pressing the, the, um, the button, and delivering heat energy. Uh, it has about a 70% or so success rate with one treatment that does go up with repeated treatments, which can be done, but I will not lie to you and tell you it's a total piece of cake. Uh, it, it does hurt just like anything else, but many of our patients get up and go right to work. The best thing, of course, in the long term is to try and prevent the infection that causes all of this. That's HPV. Uh, we published these data before. Essentially, we have shown that we saw a 77% reduction in AIN in a population of healthy young MSM uh, with uh, the quadrivalent vaccine. That was in the per-protocol efficacy population. Even in the ITT population, which included some previously exposed people, we saw about a 50% reduction of AIN overall, and very excitingly, a statistically significant reduction in high-grade disease. So we think, and based on these data, 
that the vaccine should be useful to prevent anal cancer just like it should be useful to prevent cervical cancer. So based on the data from uh, that paper and other data, the HPV vaccination has been approved for boys and men. It had already been approved in women for uh, people routinely between the ages of 11 and 21 years in the US, permissively up to the age of 26, routinely if you're immunocompromised, and uh, you can also give the vaccine under the age of 11 as appropriate. And interestingly, it was also approved for the prevention of AIN and anal cancer in women because it's the same disease in men and women, even though we hadn't actually done the study in women. So to summarize, high-grade disease can be sought and treated to reduce the risk of anal cancer. The treatment is feasible. It's challenging, but it's feasible. And one key piece of evidence we don't have yet, but which we're hoping to get, is to prove that the uh, treatment of these lesions actually leads to a reduction in anal cancer. And then finally, the quadrivalent vaccine, I think, is the best long-term approach, and that's uh, to prevent HPV infection and AIN in uh, men who are naive to those HPV types. It's just a list of resources available for those of you who are interested. We have an international anal neoplasia society. We have a booth here, a very new and exciting organization that you'll hear more about. There's also a symposium uh, on uh, Wednesday about this. The, um, here's the website. We give courses through the ASCCP. The next one's in April in Atlanta. And here is a website that we've developed at UCSF that gives information both for providers and for patients. Thank you very much.